now it's my privilege and honor to introduce Professor Jules Hoffman, who among many distinctions won the Nobel Prize 2011 on medicine and physiology. Professor Hoffman uh, was born in Luxembourg and did his undergraduate both in chemistry and biology at the University of Strasbourg in France, as well as his PhD. And I was reading several notes, biographical sketches on uh, about him. And one of the biographies says that, maybe, I don't know if this is true, so please correct me, that since you were a little boy, you were very interested in biology and mainly uh, due to maybe some uh, uh, examples from your father. I don't know if it's true, but I thought it was nice, so I decided I was going to repeat because it's always nice to, to read and hear that a parent has a good example for a, a, a person. Well, he got his prize on using the Rosopla, the fly, uh, uh, fruit fly for model, and he discovered the tall like receptors as well as the more important than the tall receptors is the innate immunity. And um, if I go back to the time when I was a student in the last millennium, to the discoveries that we have nowadays, immunology has changed completely, and innate immunity is playing a central role in the new medicine that we are going to live in the next uh, decades. Uh, he received so many uh, awards that from 2003 to 2011, he got 11 uh, smaller awards, really minors. The Nobel Prize, he won the gold medal from CNRS, Robert Koch Prize, Cancer Research Institute Award, Bausen Prize, uh, KU Medical Award, and among uh, several others. On top of that, he was also the vice president and the president of the French Academy. And uh, he is still at the University of Strasbourg. And I want to thank uh, the organizers, Vivaldi Miraneto and Professor Jacob Alice, both professors, for giving me the honor to introduce such a, a beautiful person. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for those uh, warm words and all the exaggerations which I have to accept each time. And um, so let me uh, start by thanking my good old time friends, Professor Krieg and Professor Palis, with whom we work quite a bit uh, at the level of the uh, organization of sciences in the academy over many, uh, many years. So what I would like to do uh, today is, um, first of all, explain to you why would you want to work on insects? And uh, that's the question I get most often in my, in my life re of recent times. Second question, uh, second question then, uh, what does this bring? What does it bring to, um, to human health, for instance? So I'm trying to make sort of an, an uh, essay of uh, the years which are behind us and explain to you what is the interest, why we did it, and what is the potential interest. And of course I'll refer to, I'm not a medical doctor, and uh, everything which has a medical context, context was done with colleagues from other countries, and I'll mention their names, particularly Charlie Janeway, and um, Elmer Zikovic in the United States. So, uh, I'll start. I was told that the audience was relatively v varied, and so we do not only have medical people here or biologists. So let me just give you a, a short background and um, a few words of introduction. It's only be four or five slides. Number one, 
A result which, when I learned about this uh, 20 years ago, was also very surprising to me. It's the life expectancy. We know that from the Paleolithic to uh, the present. Of course, we know that through uh, the skeletons which have been unearthed in the Paleolithic. And uh, you see the uh, life expectancy, that is to say, the number of years which, on average, a child which is born on day zero is supposed to, can uh, expect to live through, has been, uh, in those previous times, has been around, uh, um, the average 50% was about 20, 22 years. There, was, well, there were always, excuse me, some people who got old, you know that sitting bull in the United States died at the age of uh, uh, 62 only. And uh, this is a value for Neolithic and for Breslau. The Breslau is now in Poland, was in Germany at that time. And uh, you see there has been no significant change uh, between the Paleolithic and uh, 1690. And then we go to Liverpool in 1860 and still no significant change. And then all of a sudden, well not all of a sudden, but over a period of 150 years, you see there's a dramatic increase in life expectancy. So most of the people are not aware of that. And so what happened uh, between 1850 and uh, 2000, and I'm going to very shortly in two slides explain this to you, there were groundbreaking discoveries in immunology and microbiology which allowed the threefold increase of life expectancy between so 1850 and 2000. Three aspects account for this. Number one, hygiene, extremely important and antisepsis, discovery of antisepsis and asepsis. And then vaccination. Vaccination is the single event which has saved the, most num the highest number of lives in the history of medicine. It's probably about two billion lives have been saved by vaccination in 150 years. I'm just paying credit rapidly to Louis Pasteur, uh, Robert Koch in Germany and Paul Ehrlich there are many others, but I have, of course, no time to go into this. And then the third aspect, uh, in addition to hygiene and to vaccination, is antibiotics. And let me just show Gerhard Domak, who discovered the sulfur mines, and then the uh, penicillin. Penicillin was discovered by Fleming, Florian Chain, and, well, collaboration and so on. And uh, streptomycin by Salmon Baxman. And <clears throat> so these are the three essential aspects which explain why uh, life expectancy has dramatically increased over this short period. Now, the situation today is a little bit complex because there are persisting and increasing problems, threats. Number one, adequate hygiene is still problematic in many regions of the planet and even in uh, many suburbs of the, uh, the big cities in uh, the Western world. Vaccines are in existence for essential microbial aggressors. I'm just mentioning HIV but also Staph aureus, one of the most common uh, pathogens in our hospitals and all around. We have no vaccine against Staph aureus. We have nearly no vaccine, no active vaccine against streptococci and so on and so on, pneumococci and so on and so on. So you see, this is a whole area which is not covered right now by uh, modern uh, methodologies. Uh, often they are insuff they insufficiently protect against certain microbial strains that means that only uh, 60 or 70 percent of the people who receive the vaccine are actually protected. And finally, additional vaccination is being opposed by various, I put, ill-informed or sectarian groups, but that's my judgment. Now, the another point which is important is that microbes are becoming increasingly resistant now against uh, various antibiotics. So this is a situation in which we are now, I mean, worldwide, in which we are now, and um, so it is certainly of interest, obviously, uh, that uh, science and biomedical science is uh, continuously efforts to improve our defenses against the microbes over the next uh, decades. Now, does this bring us to insects? Well, let me, uh, well, as I have the, the privilege to talk to you this evening, let me just speak a little bit about this aspect. Why can, you, why can insects be helpful here? And, uh, during the introduction, very nicely, my father was mentioned, and actually I grew up in Luxembourg, and he was a high school teacher, and he was, uh, doing, uh, he was doing a lot of research on, in the field on insect species and their variations and so on. 
And this actually uh, generated an interest in me. And when I went to Strasbourg for my university studies in zoology and biology, there was some chemistry, in, but it was essentially zoology and biology. Uh, this is the Institute of Zoology in Strasbourg. There was one person there, uh, Pierre Joly, who proposed to me that I do a PhD with him. And Pierre Joly, it's uh, interesting to reflect on the origins of this. Uh, Pierre Joly was working on grasshoppers. Let me show you a grasshopper. Uh, <laughs> you must have some of these also in this country. And why would you work on grasshoppers at that time in France? This is in the 60s. France had what I call, in the correct, politically correct jargon, had responsibilities in North Africa. And uh, there, was a, there were big problems with uh, grasshoppers there, particularly those enormous swarms in the Niger Valley and so on. And uh, it had been understood at that time that there was a new endocrine control of uh, the, uh, this swarm formation, that's to say, from a, a solitary phase, they would go, the insects would go to a gregarian phase, which would allow them then, and so on, so on, so on. And uh, the laboratory worked on this uh, aspect. Now, what uh, Professor Joly, he was um, really a zoologist in the classical term, in the experimental term, I should say. What they were doing was uh, exhibiting a gland, <coughs> an organ, from one insect and then transplanting it to another insect and to see how it affected or not the reproduction, development, and so on. And so that was classical endocrinology. <coughs> and he reflected to me when we uh, started this, he re reflected that this field had, uh, was going to, going to end because there was no biochemistry available at that time in our laboratories. So because he said, we have done everything we could do. Uh, we have to look at in another direction. So that was essentially the way we got at the problem, which is uh, the one I'm going to explain to you. We knew at that time that <coughs> insects are uh, infected by bacteria, fungi, viruses, and protozoa. And let me just remind you, but I don't have to do this in a country like Brazil, that insects account for 80% of all living species on Earth. And they annually destroy one-third of all human crops. And further on, they put one-third of, of humanity and livestock at risk of bacterial, fungal, violence, so on, parasitic infections via their vector capacities. Okay, that was known. But the point, the interesting point to uh, Professor Jolie and me was the following. They are particularly resistant to infections. And how we did, know, did we know that? Now, I'm coming back again to Pierre Jolie. He said during all his studies, over 30 years, when he was transplanting organs, he had never taken any precaution of asepsis. He just didn't care about it. And they never died. There was never an infection in those insects. And let me get, uh, just give an example here. This is work by uh, Wigglesworth from Cambridge, who was really the father of uh, insect physiology, as we say. And this is a parabiosis, which you can do very easily, I would say. You put two individuals together. You select, of course, the stage of development of the recipient and that of the receiver. And then you look at the effect which you have induced. And in this case, again, no precautions of asepsis and the animal survived without developing infection. So bottom line, what we knew now at that time was, number one, this enormous group with an enormous relevance for us and for nature, ecology, uh, is very, uh, very powerful in its defenses against microbes, but we didn't know the mechanism. So the idea was understand the mechanism. I must say this was uh, really, um, uh, after, uh, some of your slides uh, made that reflection also to me. I mean, this was not uh, the origin of, the, uh, of our problematic was not to try to find some application, was just to understand uh, what was going on in nature. So how does this happen? And we didn't think at that time, we actually, I must say, we thought that it would be very different from uh, human defenses, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So curiosity driven, basically. Now, uh, let's just jump by 20 years now. I'm not going to go into the detail. We started on grasshoppers and then we went to large blowflies. And just speaking about the last 20 years when uh, we were looking at Drosophila, the, um, the fruit fly. And here in this uh, example, we're injecting on uh, the left side, we're injecting into a fly um, a certain number of uh, microbes. Then we take 
uh, the blood out of a certain time, a certain interval of time, and we look and we test. This was a very simple growth inhibition assay. We're looking at the appearance in the blood of the insect. This was cell-free blood uh, of an antimicrobial activity. And we see that the injection has induced a strong antimicrobial activity. And what we did not know was the nature of the molecules which accounted for this activity. So question number one, which we're going to ask, what is the identity of the molecules which account for this uh, inducible activity? Question number two, we supposed to, we uh, expected they would be peptides, polypeptides, for a reason to which I'll come back in a moment. And what is the control of expression of the genes encoding those peptides? And then question number three, uh, what are the receptors which the insect has uh, to recognize that an infection is going on and can it potentially, possibly, uh, discriminate between various type of, types of aggressors? So, um, as we, uh, I will strictly keep to my time limit, I will, uh, in this slide, what I want to show is the summary of several years of, uh, of studies, chemical studies and biochemical studies in the laboratory. And what we found was that essentially uh, the fat body, which is the equivalent of the mammalian liver in the fly, produces a series, uh, a battery, we we'll say, of families of antimicrobial peptides, which are short, uh, relatively short molecules, which are shown here, and we, which are active against, let me put it, let me s make this clear, either against gram-negative bacteria, this is the case of the tericins, the tassins, prosocins, cecropins, against uh, uh, gram-positive bacteria as shown here, the pensins, and then against fungi, drosomycins, and metchnikovic. So these were novel molecules, and uh, I should say cecropins were uh, identical to the ones which had been identified by Hans Bowman in, the, uh, in butterflies a few years earlier. So here we were in the presence of a uh, uh, first, first sort of answer. One aspect of the antimicrobial defense is the induction of antimicrobial peptides, which uh, are, also to make this very short, they are membrane disruptive. And uh, so with various uh, spectra of, uh, uh, of uh, activities. They reach very high concentrations, they are secreted into blood where they reach very high concentrations. Now in parallel, at that time, colleagues from uh, the United States, this was UCLA, Los Angeles, um, Tom Gans shown here and uh, Bob Lair together discovered that humans also produce, we humans, uh, produce a variety of antimicrobial peptides. They are a little bit, uh, the list is less long, but they are very potent molecules uh, produced on the skin, in the lungs, kidneys, your genital tract, in the eye, in the mouth, and intestine. And um, Now the point is that these molecules and we'll speak about, uh, we come back to innate immunity. These molecules are really the first barrier of defense. They are on our epithelia. They're, they are the molecules which encounter the uh, invading microbes. And we produce enormous amounts on our skin. Every day we produce 10 grams of these antimicrobial peptides. And uh, so um, this had been long underestimated, but that's really, and the same is true in the intestine, the same is true in the kidney, and so on, as shown here. So here we were now, and this was all this was apparent when um, uh, I organized uh, with, uh, here with Charlie Janeway, is shown here. Oh. Yeah, this is Charlie Janeway. Uh, he was from Yale, and uh, Alan Nezikovic uh, from uh, Harvard Medical School. I had contacted these persons in 92, um, as uh, it has been uh, uh, recalled a few minutes uh, earlier, uh, at that stage, because of uh, the reasons of the beauty of the receptive production in the lymphocytes, in the mammalian, in uh, mice and humans, there had been relatively little interest in innate immunity. It was sort of a neglected field. And there were only a few laboratories uh, in the world, and among those, uh, the laboratory at Yale of uh, Charlie Janeway, come back to him in a second, and uh, Alan Zikovic. Charlie Janeway was interested essentially in understanding what activated the adaptive immune response. That'll be clear in a few, come clear in a few minutes, I hope. Alan Zikovic, Alan Zikovic was interested in what he called the anti-antibody response. That's to say a response which appears before the antibodies come up. And that was essentially activation of complement in his case by uh, various types of lectins. So we teamed together in 92, I visited uh, 
uh, them in their laboratories, and we decided we would try to work in parallel between the mouse and the humans. They were medical people, as I mentioned. That was not the case for any of our collaborators in Strasbourg. And uh, to see if the fly system would allow, for instance, to uh, be more rapid in a certain number of analyses. Okay, and in this meeting, you see, it's, uh, those were the people whom we really could uh, invite at that time. It was still a very small crowd from over the world, and this has, of course, dramatically changed. Now, uh, yeah, this is uh, Bob Lehrer and um, Hans Bohmann the person who had discovered the first inducible antimicrobial peptide in butterflies in Stockholm. Uh, both uh, Bowman and uh, Janeway have passed away a few years ago. So here we are now in the, in the following situation. We know that an essential aspect of response, response in the fly to an injury is producing antimicrobial peptides. It was not clear, and it is not in all situations clear, if the system is inducible in mammals it is to some extent useful, but it's also largely constitutive. So we have these peptides, and uh, now we're trying to understand how, uh, how are they, how is their production controlled? How are the genes encoding these peptides uh, upregulated during the immune response? And uh, here we were lucky uh, when we uh, attacked this problem in the fly to find that when we, when we cloned the, uh, the genes, corresponding genes, this is the case of diphtericin, uh, this is a coding sequence. So we found in the promoter of these uh, genes, we found uh, elements which are named, referred to as kappa B response element. Uh, that will, be, will become clear in a second. Let me just put it this way, NF kappa B stands for nuclear factor kappa B. It was found in B lymphomas by David Baltimore in 86 as the essential agent controlling expression of immune and stress response genes in was at that time found in uh, mice, and we now know it's nearly everywhere. Now, uh, NF-kappa-B is shown here, and the interesting point is that this activator, so this molecule which is going to control the expression of the genes, this activator is present all the time in the cells, but it is blocked. It's blocked by an inhibitor, binding to an in inhibitor, which is referred to as inhibitor of kappa-B. So we have this couple in the, pr uh, in the cells, and now they will dissociate upon a uh, signal, and this transactivator will go into the nucleus and control expression of the genes. So the extreme interest on this system is that it's, it's nearly immediate. You don't need a lot of synthesis, you don't need this. And um, so um, at that time, there was one NF-kappa-B family member known in the fly, and that is shown in the next slide. And that had been uh, discovered in a series of experiments into which I, have, I don't have the time to go into these, by Nusslein Vollhardt in uh, Tübingen, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 95. She had looked at the um, uh, control of dorsal ventral axis and anterior posterior axis in the fly. And for this, they were feeding the adults on uh, mutagenes. The mutagenes would induce mutations. One gene out of one out of 3,000, and this, in this series, they would be able to screen for embryos which were abnormally developed. And then they would uh, go on and try to uh, understand what was actually going on. And uh, so, uh, I'll be short again on this. And uh, so what they found in their studies was that actually the embryo required for its it required for its uh, normal development, also eventual development, required a gene, they called it twist, which was controlled by a um, gene product which they called dorsal, inhibited by gene product which they called cactus, and uh, this, this turned out to be that nf kappa b family member, i kappa b family member, and then the important point was that they showed that this system would dissociate upon an input from a signal cascade which was initiated at the cytoplasmic membrane through a transmembrane receptor, which they referred to as TOL, in reference to the abnormal appearance, as biologists say, phenotype, of the mutated embryo. From there on, they uh, showed that it was whole cascade activating the system. We have, don't have to go into this now. Just note here that we have one uh, gene product, they called it Spätzle. Those of you who have contact with German cuisine understand uh, what phenotype uh, 
the uh, abnormal embryo could have. And so this uh, system becomes activated. So what was the interesting point for us was that this was a developmental regulation. Now, these genes were considered as being embryo, uh, sorry, maternally expressed genes. That is to say, the genes are transcribed in the mother before the egg is laid. Could this system be reused later in development for, for instance, uh, controlling microbial infections? That was the question. Now, before I uh, take this question, let me just show because uh, it's too beautiful. Those images are too beautiful. They are from, uh, it's a compound from uh, several laboratories in the United States. But just to illustrate, this is the 3D structure of NF-kappa-B in the cytoplasm blocked by binding to the inhibitor I-kappa-B. Now, what happens is that in kinases, so in activating enzyme, which the name doesn't, is irrelevant for us now, will put a phosphate group on this uh, inhibitor, which will change its conformation and dissociate and become degraded. Now we have naked NF-kappa-B here, which is going to dimerize with another partner and then go into the nucleus, put uh, itself around, this is DNA, around DNA, and then activate gene transcription. So this is uh, the essential, I would say, an essential paradigm of uh, transcription control in the system of stress and immune responses. Now, is this uh, true in the case of uh, the immune response? At that time, it was not known that it was true in the case for, of the immune responses of uh, mammals or insects. So what we then did, we undertook a long story over several years, uh, and we were, um, I'll show the pictures of my main collaborators a little bit later, but um, it took us really about six years to fully understand the system, and uh, to find, as shown here, to uh, find that actually the antimicrobial peptides, which I uh, mentioned earlier, are controlled by two distinct pathways. One is the partial reuse of the whole pathway, only the partial reuse, including Spätzle, I will say, and it will control the expression, the activation of NF-kappa B. There are two uh, family members here, but that's not relevant for us today. And they control expression of the antifungal and uh, the antibacterial peptides active against gram-positive bacteria. On the other side, uh, we have uh, we found a second pathway, which we refer to as IMD for immune deficiency, which uh, responds to gram-negative bacteria, controls the expression of antibacterial peptides active against gram-negatives via an NF-kappa B family member, which goes by the name of relish. Again, not relevant for the expression this afternoon. Now, what was relevant then was that we could show that um, uh, tall pathway mutants uh, are very sensitive to fungal infections. This is survival uh, in wild-type flies, and this is in tall mutants. So this clearly shows up to two days. You have a fantastic decrease in viability of these. So tall is via the genes it's uh, the expression of which it controls is uh, extremely important for the survival of the flies. And when we look at IMD pathway mutants, that's the second pathway uh, active against, uh, which defends against gram-negative infection, E. coli, we have uh, here um, the, um, an appearance which confirms that this, the IMD gene is uh, extremely important for survival to the, this type of infection. And we published this um, with um, Bruno Lemaitre and Jean-Marc Reichardt and two students here in 96 in uh, the cell. This is a fly uh, which is deficient in toll and which has been infected by uh, fungus. And uh, so what we then relatively, um, I should say we were very careful in saying that this regulatory cascade, Spätzle, toll and cactus, cactus the inhibitor, toll the transmembrane receptor, Spätzle the interacting molecule with the toll receptor, controls the potent and fungal response of the adults. Now, as we will see in a moment, uh, this was, uh, this had really a relatively important relevance. Uh, I'm, uh, we'll speak about that in a few minutes when we go to the mammalian question. But still, what I want to mention here, at that stage, that's why I said we were modest. Uh, we didn't uh, say too much. Uh, we didn't conclude too much from our results because it appeared quickly that the fly has nine toll receptors, and none of them really interacts with uh, a microbial ligand. They are all activated by Spätzle, by Klee Spätzle. So in other words, at this stage, we still didn't know what were really the receptors for the infection. 
We knew that uh, the part of this was required, but we didn't know the identity of receptors. On the other side, in uh, the AMD pathway, we didn't know at all the identity of the receptors. So it took several years, again, and uh, for the whole laboratory and uh, to uh, come to a better understanding of this. In between, we had been joined by other laboratories uh, in the world. And what uh, gave us a breakthrough was ex were experiments. This is Julien Royer in the laboratory in 2001, you see. He generated a mutation in a member of a family to which I'll, I'll show that in the next slide, uh, PGRP. Uh, and uh, in this uh, infected fly, if he infects the fly which, uh, with a mutation in this gene, uh, it does not survive gram-positive infection. It does survive gram-negative bacterial infection. Now, we were fortunate at the time, again, Julien Royer, Dominique Ferrandon in the laboratory, uh, to find that a mutation in another member of that family uh, diminished uh, resistance to gram-negative bacterial infection. Now, what are those molecules, PGRPs? Just one slide to situate this uh, very beautiful uh, biological problem. They stem from very ancient, evolutionary ancient amidases. And those amidases, they're present already in bacteriophage. And uh, the fly has 13 of these, the small ones and larger ones. They all have in common a domain, which is shown here, with a groove. And this groove is the ancient amidase groove. And this groove can either demolish peptidoglycan, which is a component of the, uh, of the cell wall of the both gram-positives and gram-negatives, and then either can demolish it or, after mutations, is unable to demolish it and will bind to the peptidoglycan and then induce the activation of the cascade, as I'll show in one of the next slides. So, um, just to show that in uh, the situation, like always, as we found, was also existed also in mammals. Uh, this is work of Roman Jarsky. Uh, and uh, we do produce in our eyes, in the liver, in the digestive tract, from the mouth to the intestine, on the skin and so on. We produce also molecules uh, b which belong to this family of peptidoglycan recognition proteins. Now, let us summarize this. this. This is a cell, which is now in a fly, which is being, uh, let's say, aggressed, for instance, by fungi. Now, uh, we could show, and I'm not going to demonstrate this, that uh, beta-glucan of fungal origin will interact with a dedicated protein in the blood, GMDP3, it doesn't matter for us. So the beta-glucan will activate the proteolytic cascade, lead to the cleavage of Spätzle, which will interact with toll and activate the system. So this is the response to fungi, oversimplified, of course. Uh, Gram-positive bacteria will also activate this cascade, but by interacting with a peptidoglycan recognition protein, and uh, then the proteolytic cascade will also lead to Spätzle cleavage and activation of the system. And on the other hand, a gram-negative bacteria interact, so the uh, peptoglycan of these bacteria, which is a little bit different from that here, and structurally will interact with another receptor of the same family, but this one is on the membrane, it is not in circulation, and that will activate the IMD pathway. So in essence, uh, this summarizes what we have now understood in the fly. Um, I mean, we're just probably at the tip of the iceberg in the system, but just uh, we can have now some sort of large explanation which uh, gives us a very few molecules, and this is very important actually, a very few molecules, structurally different molecules, peptidoglycan and beta-glucan, which are, I mean, there are no fungi without beta-glucan, there are no bacteria without uh, peptidoglycan. So those molecules are recognized by this uh, uh, system, this immune system of life, which is not a primitive immune system, as you see, but a very sophisticated immune system, because this allows to really respond to all microbes with very small repertoire of recognition protein. So this will then activate uh, either the AMD pathway, we'll come to that in a moment, or the toll pathway, as we said, and uh, via this uh, cytoplasm, the cleavage, uh, the cleavage uh, in the blood. Now let's rapidly go now from insects to mammals. So um, in mammals, it was known that there's an innate immune response which is an immediate defense reaction. There's no memory of aggressors. So this will not allow uh, vaccination. It's what you induce when you shave, you shave badly in the morning. It doesn't help if you, sh uh, if you uh, make an injury every morning over 30 days. 
the response will be the same. There's no uh, vaccination part. But then, adaptive immunity is the other immune response, which had been very well uh, studied uh, from the 50s on uh, last century. It's a slow reaction. It takes several days, up to seven days. It is based essentially on lymphocytes. It has a vast number of receptors. Every one of us at this very moment in the audience has about uh, several million of uh, distinct receptors on the lymphocytes in his blood. And it has memory cells which enable vaccination. Now, uh, I'm coming back to Charlie Janeway now. What he and others thought that the uh, adaptive immunity, uh, which as I mentioned takes several days to uh, become active, become really uh, uh, powerful, it needs a boost. Where does this boost come from? And uh, so what was uh, surmised, uh, this is Ralph Steinman, who shared the Nobel Prize with Bruce Beutler and me in 11 on this topic. So uh, they, he had worked on dendritic cells, which are innate immune cells, which respond to microbial fragments or by a phag phagocytosis of microbes by activating NF-kappa-B. So we are familiar now with NF-kappa-B. What does NF-kappa-B do here? in this case, sorry, uh, it activates innate immune response genes, like the antimicrobial peptides, and activates, it was surmised, the adaptive immune system. And now this was, <coughs> I'm not going into the detail of this, there's antigen presentation, it's too, sp that's really immunology, but let, me, let us just say that three distinct aspects, one, two, and three, cytokine production, will activate naive lymphocytes. So, but to demonstrate this fully, what was required was uh, to understand how the microbial fragments interacted with the dendritic cells. And uh, in uh, several laboratories throughout the world, people were looking at those receptors, which were unknown at that time. And uh, so, as I have mentioned, the contact with Charlie Janeway uh, already, and um, we had a human frontiers uh, uh, Human Frontiers grant in uh, Human Frontiers in Science grant, and uh, so we collaborated on this, and I showed our results in '96 uh, uh, to um, in our small program meeting, and uh, rapidly Roslyn Mechitov and uh, Charlie Janeway found a human homologue of Drosophila toll protein and showed that it signals activation to adaptive immunity. And the year after, Bruce Beutler. Uh, <coughs> who um, also, as I mentioned, shared the Nobel Prize. Bruce Beutler found that uh, he came from a totally different background. That's to say, uh, his background was looking at uh, uh, the production of uh, human necrosis factor, one of the uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines by lipopolysaccharide. <coughs> and he was looking for the receptor. And he found the receptor one year after that of Janeway, and it turned out to be the same uh, type of molecule. So, a toll-like receptor. So the toll-like receptor, actually, I should say it's funny. Uh, it was um, Janeway who first used the term uh, toll-like receptor in reference to the result of toll. Now, very quickly, <coughs> it's my innate immune system is fighting against viral infections. And uh, it has been 10 days already. And uh, so uh, rapidly then, it became apparent that there was a whole family of these molecules, but not an enormous family, only about a dozen of members. They are on the cytoplasmic membrane. And much of this work has been done by Shizuo Akira in Osaka, uh, with whom we also interact. And I'm, I'll be short on this, because we, uh, what I want to, the point I want to make is that these molecules recognize uh, on the surface of the cells microbial uh, ligands, <coughs> I have to take this, uh, this is primitive medicine, taking water against. That's what all, already the ancient Greeks did. And so, in response to recognizing nuclear synthesis and so on, we have no time to go into this, <coughs> they activate NF kappa B, always NF kappa B. We're not going into this, their adaptive molecules and so on. And there is activation of the adaptive immune responses and also of, of course, the antimicrobial peptides. <coughs> now, during the following years in other laboratories, and this is not work for our group, 
the various toll-like receptors the structure has been established. They are dimers as shown here. And so there's an interaction. This is a, uh, RNA interacting here with uh, and putting together two monomers into a dimer. This is the uh, signaling domain in the cytoplasm, and that will then activate the response. Now let me just uh, spend a few seconds on this slide, this slide. and uh, make the following point. Uh, initially, of course, we thought this, uh, these receptors play a role in uh, adaptive immunity, in uh, fighting infection. Now, it has appeared rapidly that in, addi in addition to infection, toll-like receptors are involved essentially in inflammation. And this has become really one of the important points now. You know, uh, all, the, uh, all the diseases where we say itis, like whatever, uveitis, and so on, they all involve the production of um, certain cytokines, and those cytokines are uh, produced under the control of toll-like receptors. But there's also in vaccination for like receptors are involved, namely many of the adjuvants which we use today, not all, but many uh, act via uh, toll-like receptors. Then they also play an enormous role in autoimmunity, for instance in lupus. They are the receptors for uh, uh, chromatin uh, and uh, for DNA chromatin as well. In allergy also. In uh, immunotherapy, and this is a very important avenue of research now, immunotherapy, particular cancer immunotherapy, where toll-like receptors play one of the roles. Um, and then in the central nervous system, they also, and this was totally unexpected, that in the central nervous system, um, now I'm getting, getting a rhinitis. And that's also, uh, it's uh, always toll-like receptors. You can't sleep without thinking of those things. And uh, now the central nervous system, we have a very strong, um, very strong action of the TLRs. For instance, if you have a stroke, and uh, then the blood uh, becomes degraded in various areas, and toll-like receptors would recognize it, and they will induce uh, uh, responses. Also in the stroke, for heart stroke, and in all these aspects, there's a role. Um, well, then in the kidneys, of course, in kidneys, if you have um, uh, immune complexes which are uh, cleared by the kidneys, and they will also activate by FTLR. So in other words, something which was uh, totally new for the community, I mean, not, uh, I mean, uh, all this work, of course, you understand this, I'm not a medical person, uh, we have not done this work in our laboratory, but this was in the community, and in the many uh, exchanges which uh, we had, uh, the, uh, arguably the first time that someone put uh, toll in the, in the context of an immune defense was the 96 paper, and ever since there have been about 25,000 papers on the roles of TLRs, essentially in clinical settings. So it has been totally, it has opened a new field, let me say, uh, in understanding. And, uh, but we are far from understanding, and in the next two or three slides, I will explain to you how far we are. Uh, the initial idea that toll-like receptors were sentinels against microbes and activated by microbial ligands, this uh, around year 2000, turned out to be too restrictive. In fact, many diverse molecules related to damaged self act as, can act as toll-like receptor agonists. And I'll give an example of this in, in this slide. TLR agonists in steroid inflammation, debris from necrotic, injured, hypoxic, tumor cells, extracellular mem membrane fragments, immune complexes, DNA chromatin complexes, all these can induce uh, immune defenses or inflammatory defenses, I should say, via toll-like receptors. Now, just to make one caveat here, um, this, uh, I've shown slides, or one slide, of the interaction of a microbial ligand with a toll-like receptor. Such studies have not yet been published for the interaction of what, let's call this self, damaged self molecules. Uh, with uh, toll-like receptors, but it is becoming, uh, this, uh, we're getting, or the community is getting uh, closer and closer to this. So the question here is, for instance, if you have an injury on your, your leg, I mean, it's a, no infection, can it? just an injury, you fall, you break something, there will be an immune defense, there will be an inflammatory defense. 
And so what are the molecules which induce this? That is the question now. And a large list of molecules has been proposed. More than 100 molecules have been proposed. And in most of the cases, TLRs are required. How it exactly goes is not fully understood yet. It's uh, still one of the frontiers. So for instance, we have fibronectin. We have modified uh, low-density lipoprotein. We have heparin sulfate, and so on and so on. I have no time to go into this. It's just to uh, realize together that it's not only a matter of responding to microbes, as we all initially thought. Now, uh, in addition to that, the idea that toll-like receptors were the unique nf kappa b activating receptors for microbial and damaged cell ligands also turned out to be too restrictive. You see, we were too optimistic in the beginning. We thought that uh, uh, things were very simple. In fact, they're extremely complicated. So not only uh, are the toll-like receptors not uh, restricted to function of fighting infection, but they also uh, are not the only receptors. There are a whole variety of other receptors which have been discovered in recent years. Those are the toll-like receptors. They are membranous. They are on membranes. And then uh, the C-type lectin receptors have been now put to, uh, forward also. They are also the membranes. I say, why do I say now? They had been around for quite some time. Initially, actually, I should say that uh, Charlie Janeway and Elna Zikovitz were looking for uh, C-type lectins, but it was not understood at the time that they could signal to NF-kappa B. And that has been uh, demonstrated uh, over the last uh, five to eight years. So now they're also in this category. They can activate uh, naive lymphocytes to become uh, strongly uh, adaptive immune. Uh, players. Now, another category in the cytoplasm, in the cytoplasm this time has been discovered, the not like receptors. I have no time to go into this, but uh, in addition, uh, receptors which recognize uh, RNA in the cytoplasm, they are referred to now as weak like receptors. They were discovered, this one was discovered around 2000, those here in 2004 by Fujita, and then uh, recently, uh, just about so, uh, one and a half years ago, a new group of receptors was found, uh, which go by the name of CGAS. They recognize in the cytoplasm DNA. So we have now a much more complete picture. And uh, in the paradigm, we now have 12 toll-like receptors in mammals, about 20 uh, C-type lectin receptors, 23 not-like receptors, three rig like receptors, and one CGAS. So this would be cytosolic DNA, uh, cytosolic RNA or viral RNA. This would be various other uh, components, including bacterial components, and this is essentially sugars. Now, uh, what I want to show here is, uh, and this is work for many laboratories, but I want to show here is that we are in a totally different situation from where we were about, let me say, 30 years ago. And it was, uh, I was privileged to live through that situation. We have been small actors, or as I say, small saints in a big church. But uh, I was privileged to, uh, to go through all this, to hear these discoveries uh, from uh, the people who did them, and by and by, and to see how the system, how we better understood it, and how it became so much more comple complex. And uh, so um, all of these systems now are, of course, targets for uh, therapy, potential targets, I should say, for therapy. And this is now, again, a field which is going very, uh, progressing very quickly. And I'm not progressing, but I'm coming to the end of my presentation. And uh, I'm finishing, uh, as, you know, as I mentioned repeatedly, I'm a zoologist by training, so I'm going back to evolution, which was my first interest, and a few evolutionary perspectives. In 99, again, with uh, Charlie Janeway, as shown here, Elna Zikovic, who I've mentioned, and Fotis Kafatos at that time was uh, head of the uh, European Laboratory of Molecular Biology. We uh, were, we compared Drosophila, what we knew in Drosophila, to what was coming out in the mammals. And we said, we're not going through the names of all this, but just to show we understood there was a conserved tall TLR pathway in innate immunity in Drosophila and mammals. But at that time, we still didn't realize, and no one realized at that time, how important the system was in a mammalian uh, defense against uh, all what I've shown in one of the preceding slides. <coughs> now, uh, if we go beyond this and now look not only on the toll system, and this is uh, what we, uh, this is what came out uh, over the, in the two years 2005 until 2010, we're comparing here toll 
and IMD in the flies, the activation system, which leads always to NF-kappa B. This is the paradigm of the uh, presentation this afternoon, activation of NF-kappa B and gene transcript. I'm not giving you all the names, but just uh, look at the colors. To uh, uh, Those we have downstream here in uh, uh, the two systems. If we compare with mice, you see we have the receptors. They are receptors on the membrane, either for um, uh, cleaved Spätzle, the cytokine, or cleaved the TNF alpha and so on, and these adapter proteins, and then uh, those kinases which will activate the system and always end up coming. So this was really, I mean, for a zoologist, this was unbelievable when you, after so many years in the field, where you wanted to find something totally different, you find uh, in parallel in the fly system and in the uh, mouse system, you find that actually we have the presence of something extremely similar. And uh, so one of my last slides uh, will be the following one. Of course, flies are not the ancestors of mice, and mice are not the ancestors of flies. So when did this system appear? And now you know that there are thousands of uh, uh, genomes have been sequenced over the last years. And now you can uh, look, you can make uh, uh, analysis of the gene sequences, uh, of the uh, sequences in the genomes. And uh, then what was apparent then was that nearly all the members which I have described to you in the fly are present already in the C anemone. And everything which we found, there's nothing which was missing from the C anemone. But what was even more surprising is vertebrates are here. Vertebrates make up 5% of all uh, species on Earth now. There's the invertebrates make up 95%. Now, the C, the innate immunity of the C anemone is much closer to that of mice than to that of flies. And why is that? It is essentially because the fly, all those groups have started, we propose, and this uh, appears convincing to everyone, at the st first stage, this would call, be called multicellularity. When we pass from a unicellular, monocellular organism to a multicellular organism, all those animals had, at the beginning, so which would be around one billion years ago, they had the uh, toolbox, the toolkit for innate immunity, and that toolkit has persisted from the sea anemone up to, uh, to humans. And it has been, of course, each group has played with it according to its own agenda. And <coughs> uh, Drosophila has uh, largely simplified the system, uh, made it more efficient, uh, and obviously uh, accepted for its situation. And uh, we have, uh, uh, an important, the important point is that 95% of all the species, 95% of all the species on Earth, including Brazil, uh, fight microbes uniquely with the uh, innate immune system. And now, in the, uh, what happened, what ch changed here between uh, vertebrates and this group is essentially that we had uh, the lymphocytes started developing this large repertoire of immunoglobulin receptors, so B cells, B cell receptors, which then are at the basis essentially of uh, uh, vaccination. Well, it was not done probably for vaccination. That, um, which allows for vaccination and which gives a memory. And it makes, it makes sense, if you wish, in the sense that flies, for instance, produce an enormous offspring in three weeks, whereas uh, uh, mammals uh, produce a small offspring and over a long period of life. So you need, I mean, the uh, possibility of encountering the same pathogen uh, repeatedly, is, of course, much bigger than uh, the mammalian, in, let us say, invertebrate system. Uh, than in <coughs> the invertebrate system. So I'm going to conclude from this now in uh, two slides, and that will be the end of my presentation. So the con concluding remarks, our understanding of antimicrobial defenses has undergone in the last 30 years a paradigm shift. And um, as the analysis of the highly sophisticated adaptive immune, essentially a lymphocyte-based immunity, has made spectacular progress, the relatively poor investigated innate immunity has revealed its high degree of sophistication, complexity, and efficiency. In particular, it has become apparent that innate immunity accounts for 
of successful antimicrobial defenses in 95% of all animal species, species as existing today. And probably, and this is a quote which I take from uh, uh, Rolf Singernagel, uh, probably directly for 95% of our own defenses. So 95% of our own defenses, according to what clinicians uh, believe today, or those who are involved in this research, uh, are explained by innate immunity. And it is only uh, when uh, bacteria, fungi, when they overcome this innate immune response, that they really become what we call pathogens. And uh, uh, um, I'll uh, come back to this point just in a second. Uh, I've discovered, I mean, uh, certainly some people uh, were aware of that, but it's in the, in the meetings, in the discussions in the meetings, that it became apparent to me that of the millions of species of a bacteria, of bacteria, only about 25, let's go to 50, are a problem for human health. Of the uh, millions of species of fungi, there are about 12 species which are a problem for normal humans. If you go to immunocompromised humans, then you would go up to 600 species. But it's something which is really striking. And of the millions and millions of species of uh, viruses, you don't even know where you stop with uh, in the species. There are only about 200 which are a problem for us humans. And all this is, I mean, this defense is the, defense, the normal defense of innate immunity. And when the system uh, it be, is overcome, so when, for instance, the microbe is not taken care of by the innate immune system, then it becomes what we call traditionally a pathogen. It's a pathogen, it creates a disease. And then only the uh, adaptive immune system will be able to get us rid of uh, this species. So <coughs> okay, and with that, uh, yes, uh, after, I'm insisting after it has been boosted by the innate immune system. <coughs> so with that, I will close. I will just uh, want to thank the co-workers uh, who have been with me over those many years. And uh, these are their names, and they have had their own groups and uh, continue uh, being with you. Daniel Hoffman, uh, she is my wife. She was the first to, my first student. Uh, at that time in France, it was allowed that you could marry a student. I don't know if it's still the case in Brazil. And uh, so Daniel was a postdoc with Hans Bohmann in Stockholm, and she, was, she found the first uh, antimicrobial peptide in our system, Bittericin. Jean-Marc Reichardt, uh, who is a geneticist by training uh, and a development biologist. Uh, and Bruno Lemaitre is a Grossophila geneticist, uh, who was the first to join our laboratory in 92. He has worked with Jean-Marc Reichardt, and uh, he's now in Lausanne. Uh, Charles Hetru is a chemist, uh, Julien Royer, and Dominique Ferrandon a uh, Grossophila geneticist. Uh, Julien Royer is now in Marseille, Dominique Ferrandon is still with us. Uh, Jean-Luc Dimarc, a biochemist, and Philippe Boulet, uh, also a biochemist. And I should add to those, uh, the new generation of people, uh, Jean-Luc Immler, who is working on the antiviral defenses in the fly. And, uh, in Edis, and he has a strong collaboration with uh, Sao Paulo. He is uh, in the country right now. And uh, Elena Levashina, who is working on uh, this should be malaria, not paludism. And she's right now <coughs> for one more year in uh, Berlin at the Charité uh, campus. And this is our new state of the art uh, insectary where you can have the worst insects of the world and we'll keep them. And uh, we can still continue uh, receiving guests in Alsace. And yes, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, for questions in the circumvene the system the defense mechanism what really happens do they produce too many poisons is the system uh, failing or are there different pathways that they follow so that they, they can break the defenses
sorry, I'm sorry. But I still am speechless. I mean, your question is so complex. And can we break that down in a few uh, sub-questions, which I can address more precisely? So you were saying, in the system, I didn't get... Yes. And, and people get sick, and they eventually die. What happens? Do the bacteria produce too much poison? Do they follow a different pathway? Or is just a defense mechanism failing? Okay. Are we referring here to an infection? There's a word which I didn't really understand. I'm and talking about human infection. What human you infection. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see. I see. So uh, what is, uh, the, what is uh, believed today is that uh, when you have this infection, it's being, uh, it's of course, there's the uh, opposition of the macrophages, the neutrophils, and so on, and they produce cytokines. And you produce a storm of cytokines, and this storm of cytokines then will, uh, as you know, in uh, information you have, then uh, leakage out of uh, the blood from the vessels and so on, and you go to organ failure. See? And so that is the, um, the cytokine storm is one of the, uh, uh, the aspects. It, I think it's more cytokine storm than it would be uh, poisoning by the bacteria. toxin, but that's something else. We agree on that. That's something else. Did I sort of so, answer your question? Yes, you did. So you think it's essentially the cytokine storm that yes, it explains the, the clinical phenomenon. Absolutely. And it is known, there are figures uh, in the literature, in the recent literature, there are hundreds of thousands of people dying from the cytokine storms, right. particularly uh, in hospitals. And in, uh, so I think the figure for France is about 25,000 uh, uh, people die per year in hospitals uh, through uh, uh, these uh, cytokine storms. And, uh, and there's still no valid way of, uh, as far as I understand, uh, no valid way of, way of fighting this. Thank you, Professor. Julius, congratulations. Very exciting presentation. I have two questions. One is, you show that this mechanism of innate, uh, innate uh, immunity, immunity is so strong. What are the targets? therapeutic target to increase the strength of the system because this is so important that maybe we need to, 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 to put them more efficiently to work before the adaptive immune system comes out in a infection. What are the, in your opinion, the targets? Well, I, I wouldn't know of any system uh, where you would um, uh, where you would really try to uh, prevent well, normally innate immunity, if you're not immunocompromised, it should be efficient. You can, of course, uh, use probiotics. There's a whole field, which I had no time to discuss, uh, of the contact between the microbiota. You know, we have about two kilograms of microbiota, at least at my weight. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so there is, and this continuously keeps the uh, adaptive immunity uh, going or keeps it, uh, stimulates it at a low level and so there is of course there are certain number of uh, products which can help uh, uh, innate immunity but no there's no product which I would know of uh, uh, specifically now but what is in uh, the other question in the adaptive immune system when that becomes uh, in certain circumstances becomes to uh, to activate it you have uh, certain ways of uh, blocking uh, kinases for instance there are antibodies which you can administer. This is the case, for instance, in uh, various cancer forms, where you can block uh, the kinases, let's say the molecules which are on the membranes, and which will activate the system. And you the second is inflammation in coming now in every ideal tissue pathology in chronic uh, non communicable disease. Uh, diabetes, hypertension is the area where I am. Uh, do you believe that this system can play any role in inflammation and, and goes on on the physiopathology of hypertension? Okay, uh, hypertension, maybe you know more about uh, hypertension than I do. <laughs> uh, it's not a problem for flies, I think. Uh, no, but I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you're right. I mean, uh, there is uh, certainly uh, diabetes, of course, it's an autoimmune disease, and uh, 
um, obesity uh, is uh, inflammation and which uh, also feeds into uh, type 2 diabetes and so on. Oh yes, inflammation has really become, uh, if you look, yeah. Atherosclerosis, of course, yes, uh, absolutely. And you have in atherosclerosis, you have the polycystic septic people. You know, you follow the work of Goran Hansen in Stockholm, and they have done a lot of work on that, yes. So, um, uh, inflammation is extremely important, and uh, keeping inflammation under control without suppressing it is also very important. And so, and there are a certain number of ways now, there are a certain number of, uh, uh, not a certain number there, now uh, in the tens, uh, new molecules which are coming up and which selectively block the uh, uh, cascades which are downstream of for like receptors, not like receptors, big like receptors. So, so that's really, I think that's really, uh, over the next 50 years, uh, medicine is going to change. With my work, yes. And uh, particularly what is extremely uh, interesting is to see now that you can connect this also to cancer and uh, to the role of um, uh, lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, essentially T lymphocytes as well, uh, in the reaction, uh, reaction against cancer cells. And then you have these checkpoints there, but I don't know. Uh, this again is, of course, uh, from our group because we don't have those checkpoints in the plant. That you have checkpoints there which you can now suppress and then uh, really allow a very strong, a very potent uh, response against the tumor. So that's okay. But what are we going to do with all those people? <laughs> um, hi, uh, my name is Elena Laouge. I'm here from uh, the Federal University. And um, I'm a uh, doctor of geneticist, so it's a great pleasure, really, in addition to knowing your beautiful work, to hear about uh, the fly over here. So um, it was great to hear this uh, very general, um, I mean, all the aspects of toll signaling and how this is, has evolved over the years. But there's one little point which I'd like to ask you, which you have not talked about. So in recent years, there's been um, a lot of work on live imaging showing about the dynamics of toll signaling pathways in addition to others. So what I'd like to ask you is, how do you believe, and if you believe, this will affect how we understand the signal response and how we can interfere with it in several conditions about the dynamics of toll signaling. That is a very sophisticated question. <laughs> and <coughs> I, I'm uh, certainly unable to answer in a few minutes this, but I'm, uh, I agree with you. I've uh, not been active in that field, but I've seen many presentations. I agree with you that this is uh, something very important which is coming up now. And uh, now, how that, your question is how that will interfere, uh, how we can interfere with that. Or, uh, yes. Yeah. <coughs> uh, again, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm open <coughs> to answering any questions, but uh, I mean, uh, you have sort of your answer in your question. That is to say, this is going to uh, change our view, of course. And uh, we will have, uh, uh, specifically, there are a certain number of points within the signaling and within the, also, within uh, the way the cells uh, go from one uh, place to the other. I mean, from uh, uh, the uh, tissues to the lymph nodes and so on. All that is uh, being analyzed in quite some elegant detail. But uh, that would certainly change uh, the view in which we have for the time being. And I would say the view which we have in the fly in that respect is relatively simple. The fly has not an exciting uh, blood cell system. There are, there are interesting things in it, of course, but it's not uh, as uh, helpful, not as interesting as the mammalian system. Is. I'm aware this is not a good answer, but uh, it's a uh, too, too big a question to uh, find uh, one way to say, well, done. Let's take that molecule and that other. Very nice. Yeah, very nice to meet you, yeah. Professor. I have a, an interest in Evo Devo, and I had a question on uh, looking at that angle. Given the uh, the role of toll uh, signaling in development, and also in, in the immunity, how do you f um, is there is there information or research on on what kind of constraints uh, the innate the role in innate immunity can have uh, regarding, you know, 
the evolution of toll signaling in development? Yeah, I mean, um, one of uh, the uh, questions which always comes up is uh, uh, what appeared first? Uh, did the toll receptors, uh, toll or toll like receptors, are we still on? Yes. Did they first did they evolve for their uh, for immune function or for development function? Um, so, I mean, uh, there's, uh, the jury is not totally out, but still, if we go at, uh, there are very interesting studies uh, on Hydra, uh, which show that in Hydra you have the system is active uh, in fighting microbes. But uh, you also have, uh, the system is also present in sponges. Now in sponges, the problem of recognition of uh, self non service something much more complicated. It's not, it's not translatable immediately into a system like the insect system or the Eurocodate system. So can we uh, go back again to a precise aspect of your question, which I can. So you say evil devil. This is something which I like. I have a slide with evil immuno. And uh, I like to, to say that because it's uh, really very parallel here, uh, what we have. Now, your precise question is, uh, I wouldn't think that, uh, you know, it's still not very clear if the system, yeah, it's still not clear whether uh, the whole system is involved in development at all in mammals, you see. And uh, in, uh, in uh, more, I never say primitive, but more ancient systems, uh, it is <coughs> a, I wouldn't know now really of under normal developmental conditions of um, a moment where the two interfere. Uh, it may be so, but uh, unknown to me. First of all, thank you very much for your very nice presentation. And my question has to do with the adaptive immune response. Uh, if you could speculate in why really we, we need the adaptive immune uh, system. One of the reasons you already gave that the second or third Encounter with the same pathogen is much more uh, easily happening in vertebrates than in other species. But do you agree that one of the selective pressures for the appearance of the adaptive immune response is to deal with our own microbiome? Microbiota. Um, I, I'm not sure I would uh, put it that way. So. Um, I'm trying to, uh, again, I'm trying to find, uh, uh, the, in my, my perception, um, the way, well, the appearance of the adaptive immunity is something which may, uh, which I think was just a blind event in lymphocytes. As far as we understand now, lymphocytes, non-adaptive non, uh, non lymphocytes, so uh, in, uh, let me say innate immune lymphocytes have been around uh, long before uh, mammals appear. So you have their indications that they are, they are present in the hackfish, they are present in a whole variety of eurocordates, of cephalocordates, and so on. And uh, without uh, uh, producing this repertoire. The repertoire appeared when, at the time, what I put here as 450 million years uh, ago, when uh, the REC genes, REC1, REC2 genes, entered lymphocytes. And that was in uh, ciliations. It's, it's now speculated this appeared probably around 450 million years ago. And at that time, adaptive immunity became, there, there were some precursors of MHC molecules uh, all over the world. <laughs> and then uh, all this was put together. And then I think I would say it gave an enormous selective advantage then to some species. And those species had already been primed, don't forget, had been primed by the double uh, duplication of the genome at the beginning of the vertebrate uh, phylum. And so it was a whole context which allowed then adaptive immunity to appear and to become efficient. And I would say that the story of uh, the microbiota, this is not only uh, present in, you have microbiota uh, also in other species, in invertebrate species. You do have them in flies. And uh, so uh, that was, I would speak only God knows, of course. You know, I would speculate that this was the essentially event was 
when the lymphocytes really change the, their way of behavior. And the rest, and then everything co, co evolved, I would say. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, well. <coughs> Before, I think I, I can ask, make a comment. Uh, do you think with 95% uh, of our community, community being with the taller, that we may have a light at the end of the tunnel for sepsis? How is uh, the research on sepsis? Because then the number of patients that die of sepsis. And we, everything that we try is no good. We, uh, how is the research on that outcome? I would rather ask the question to you. Uh, no, you're probably I not want to <laughs> you because it's really something that bothers everyone. Absolutely, and I'm, uh, I'm aware of that, yes. With some boost, some of the uh, yeah, potential um, drugs, yeah, no, I'm I'm aware of that, and I'm I know also that many many companies in the world now trying to to find an issue there. And uh, the only thing what I can say is basic research has contributed to ask the question in a more sophisticated, uh, sophisticated way. But um, yes, we are far from. I my message was not to say that you understood that or that uh, everything uh, is false and so on. No. It's, it's no. one part of the whole family of molecules, but it is, uh, as you mentioned earlier, it is that the innate immune response now appears as something much more important than we figured. But without the adaptive immune response, still we would be unable. Yes. I mean, you have the experience of your history when you went uh, to, uh, well, when you came from Europe. And when I understood the other day, I read the figure, there were about, in North America, about 50 million Indians when the white people arrived and within something like 60 or 80 years 90% uh, were eliminated by viruses yeah. which they had developed. and that's also that's a problem which when I talk to sophisticated mammalian immunologists I always ask them how do we explain that was it a selection how why did our MHC is to say it's probably into MHC so was there a selection of MHC among the Chinese uh, the European and so and not among the it's, I don't know I think the answer is not yet there but so that would be another aspect the genetic aspect but that does not explain the my curve of survival you remember the no, that was not uh, uh, it's not linked to selection because it's too short a time well I thank you once more Fantastic. and uh, we'll see you around and thank you so much